Let's look at Romans chapter 116. Last week we talked about uh, we talked about heaven, and it was a great sermon, a lot of feedback. Really appreciate your feedback and your thoughts on that. And and um, I think one gal said, Greg, I too will swim with the dolphins in the Crystal Sea, but I will take a shower in Mountain uh, in, in Dr Pepper instead of Mountain Dew. Is what she wrote me on Facebook. So it's kind of fun. Today we're going to look at the gospel, which is the center of our hope, and then next week we shall be returning to Nehemiah. How many of you remember who poor old Nehemiah is in the Old Testament that we did the first, first nine chapters? We've got to finish up the last five. Believe it or not, I did not forget. It was intentional, but we're going to come back to Nehemiah, finish up that Old Testament book, and then looking ahead... We did First Peter as a book, and we did Nehemiah as an Old Testament book, and we've done some series in between about Jesus and Christmas and some foundations here. Looking ahead down the road, we'll be coming back to the Gospel of Mark, the shortest gospel in the life of Jesus, and looking at key lessons in the Gospel of Mark down the road, okay? So this is what it says in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. I am not, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God, for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For the gospel is a righteousness from God that is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, and this is a quote out of Habakkuk, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. So I was thinking a little about this, this concept of righteousness and the gospel and how the gospel has been entrusted to us, and I was thinking about uh, things in my life, and, and probably in our home, one of the most sacred objects in our home is my wife's hope chest. So in our bedroom, my TV sits, you got to have a TV in your bedroom, right? I mean, once the kids are old enough. So my TV sits on the hope chest, and all throughout my married life, when we lived in an apartment that was 600 square, well, 400 square feet, the first one, and this massive hope chest weighs 1,000 pounds. And here, me and my pretty little bride are having to move this thing around. And it always felt like a hernia every time. And so I'd say, honey, why don't we just, why don't we just get rid of some of this junk in here? To which her face kind of did this. <laughs> what? It was, like, it was like I cut her, you know, like I slashed her or something. And then I did that a few times throughout my early married years, to which I finally figured out, because I'm slow, I'm dense, Okay that this was a really bad idea. Stop asking to get rid of the hope chest. She finally explained to me, hey, you know what's in there? The flowers from our wedding. Your letterman's jacket when we first met. My grandmother's Bible, you know, all this stuff, all these things. And pretty soon I realized, man, that's like the whole history of our family in that hope chest. So the hope chest, the house can burn down, but I better rescue the hope chest, right? So it's one of those things because, you know what, what's in it is sacred. It's been something that is precious about her family. And if I want to honor her, I honor the hope chest and what's in it. Across our bedroom is something precious to me that I feel the same way about. It's a shadow box. It has a tightly folded American flag that a U.S. Army honor guard gave to my mother at my dad's funeral for his service in two wars. 26 years in the Army. Nice tight thing on behalf of a grateful president. We thank you for his sacrifice and his honor and his duty and all those things. And so I have that with some pictures of my father since he's gone. And, and it's just it's one of those things that my younger brother and I said, no matter what happens in our lives, one of us will take care of dad's flag and take care of that and hand that down throughout the generations. And so you get these things that are just kind of sacred in your life. And out on our front uh, living room is my my mother's NIV Bible. And the reason that's sacred to me is when I was young, my mom used to sit on her bed up in her bedroom and she would read the Bible and talk to God. And I was a curious young man struggling with, you know, hey, what about this plucking your eye out of your head, you know, if you sin or cutting off your hand? That sounds a little radical, mom, and those kinds of things that Jesus said. And so she would call me up on her bed and I would sit with her and she would pour over the scriptures as she wrapped her arm around me and helped me to balance my understanding of Jesus and my faith. And so it's very precious to me. All those things being said is this. There are sacred trusts, right? Those things in my life are things that are sacred to me. 
And for the believer, the gospel is the sacred trust. It is literally given to us, handed down from Jesus to the apostles, including Paul, as one abnormally born, the 13th apostle. And then it's given from them as a sacred trust to the disciples, the followers of Jesus Christ. And I think too often today, because we have the gospel and we know Jesus, many of us, and because we think we know it inside and out, that we handle it not with kit gloves that are white and polished, but with a little bit of irreverence and foolhardiness. We forget that it's the whole foundation of why we exist, why we gather here today, is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what is that gospel? Paul makes it very simple in 1 Corinthians 15. Chapter 15, verse 1, he says, What I received, what I received from God, I gave to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and then on the third day that he rose from the dead according to the scriptures, and then he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, and then to more than 500 people over a 40-day span. And so Paul defines what the gospel is. The gospel is Jesus Christ's life and death and resurrection on our behalf purchasing a means for us to make peace with God, okay? And so it's, it's very important. It's a sacred trust. Now, what's interesting about that is where Paul says, I have become all things to all men that I might share the gospel and save anyone, which he does in 1 Corinthians 9. Most of us modern-day Christians say, that's great and that's wonderful, but that's for somebody else to share. That's not my spiritual gift to share the gospel, so I looked it up. 80% of us evangelicals in the United States do not share our faith. Eight out of ten of us say the gospel's great, I have eternal life, I know Jesus, I got it, all that stuff, but the rest of you, you're on your own. That's not really what we say. What we really say, though, is the, the reasons why we don't do that. We say, what if the other person is insulted? What if it hurts my relationship? What if... What if they dislike it? What if it comes back on me with persecution or those kinds of things? That's what people report of the reasons why they don't share the gospel. And those are legitimate reasons. They're not judging. They're legitimate. It's tough. And then the other thing is people say, I just don't feel equipped. I don't feel like, like I know the gospel well enough to do a good job. And I don't want to handle it poorly. And that's a legitimate reason too. But eight out of ten of us say that we do not share the gospel. So let's just look here at chapter 1, verse 14, right? Let's start a little bit earlier. It says, Paul says, I am obligated to the Greeks and to non-Greeks, both to the wise in this world and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to what? To preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. Paul's making a big deal here. He's saying, I preach the gospel to everybody. Greeks were the, the highest civilization before Rome, and the Romans kind of copied their culture on the Greek c culture. It inherited their gods, inherited their intelligence, and their war practices, and bettered them, and made themselves the great empire. They were great copycats, and then they made it a little bit better. But Paul's saying, I wish to go to Rome, and here three times he says, one, I am obligated. It is my duty as a follower of Christ to share the gospel with you at Rome. Now, Rome was the city of beauty and of power. Its architecture was the greatest in the world, and people modeled their cities on Rome. Its army was the greatest military that's probably ever been in the world, ever. And everybody, including the United States today, models and copies their war tactics that's successful in, in power. You know, their, their government is part of our government. Rome was the place where if everything was good, it was in Rome. But Paul says it lacks something. It lacks the gospel. And so I'm obligated to come and to teach you the gospel. And then in verse 15, he says, I'm eager. He says, I'm not only obligated by duty, but I'm eager to preach the gospel to you. I can't wait. I cannot wait to meet you in Rome and to share with you the gospel. And then in verse 16, he says, in our passage, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Not only do, is it my duty, not only can I not wait, I'm eager but I'm not ashamed of what I have to share. And even though the Romans will think that it's weak compared to their military and their power and their government and all that, in fact, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is what? It is the power of God 
to change people's lives. And then he goes into discussion in our passage today. So why was Paul so passionate for the gospel? Why was it his duty? Why was it his, his pride and joy, his desire to share? Why was it something he was not ashamed of? Why was it so important to him? Why did he desire to go to Rome and share with the largest city in the world the gospel of Jesus Christ? This is why. Because the gospel changes everything. The gospel changes everything in your life and mine. The gospel is everything that we're about. And the gospel is, in its simplest form, six things that we're going to see in this text. Okay, The first thing is, the gospel is God, right? Verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of who? God. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because I know the source of the gospel. And the source of the gospel is Jesus Christ. What I received from him, I passed on to you in first importance. That Christ died died according to the scriptures, he was buried, and he was resurrected three days later according to the scriptures. The power, the source of that power of the gospel is God. It is the power of God. And then in verse 17, a righteousness from God, right? For it is in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. It's the power of God, and it gives us a righteousness from God. So Paul says, God is the source, right? So all you good Southern Baptists can remember back to John 3, 16, right? For God so what? Loved the world, right? That he did what? He gave his only begotten son, right? His one only son. That whoever believes in Jesus Christ by faith shall not perish, but have eternal life or everlasting life, right? Right? Because God is the initiator. That verse tells us God is the initiator. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the source of all the power in our lives. God is the source of the gospel. It came from God. It's the central theme of the book of Romans. And his love propelled him to send Jesus Christ to die on our behalf on the cross. The gospel matters. And then it tells us a little bit more. Paul later on in the book of Ephesians tells us that what? That it is by grace, right? Ephesians 2.8. It is by grace that you have been saved. And this is not from yourselves. It is a what? A gift of God. So Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because I know the source. It is a free gift from God to us. Not from us seeking God, but from God to us. And so I can trust that it has power. And he knew that power personally, didn't he? When he was on the road to Damascus, when he was Saul of Tarsus, before he was the Apostle Paul, who did he meet on the road to Damascus? He met Jesus Christ, remember? Jesus Christ speaks to him and blinds him and says, Paul, who are you? Why are you pushing against me? Why are you kicking against the goats? I mean, really, Paul? Do you know who you're messing with? You can kind of see Jesus doing a little bit of that, you know? Come on. And his life is transformed because he meets the Almighty. And he's experienced that power in his life. And it changed so much for him, God's love and his goodness and his power, that he's not ashamed to to share that with other people. It is a powerful thing. You know, last week we had a little bit of fun talking about heaven. Just a great time, a great sermon, one of the funnest ones to preach. Uh, It'll be a glorious thing. But heaven is heaven, I said in that sermon, one of the six points, is because it's the residence of God. Remember that? It's only heaven because God is there. And because his beauty and his majesty and his goodness and his greatness and his joy and his love consume that place. And when we join him in that place, like the thief on the cross, we experience that bliss too. Paul knew that that was coming. He had seen Jesus Christ in some manifestation, and he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I know its source. It is the, it's from God. Ultimately, secondly, Paul would tell you it's the nature of the power of the gospel is this. Verse 16, for it is the what? The power of God. It's not just from God, a source, but its nature is powerful. It transforms men's lives. The Greek term for that is dynamis where you get your term dynamite and dynamic. Now, we all know what dynamite does, right? (laughs) Any guy who's played with an M80 in a mailbox, oh, I'm sorry, I can't confess my sins. But anybody who's done anything like that or played with Tannerite or something like that out shooting, you know how much fun it is to blow things up, right? It's just fun. 
It's fun to blow things up. Within the legal bounds of the law. But it shows the power of those substances and those chemicals, right? The power that it has. And God's power, the gospel in our lives, transforms us. And what does it do? 2 Corinthians 5.17 All things are old have passed away. And the, you are a new creation in Christ. You're a new creation in Christ. When you come to Jesus and you experience the gospel firsthand and you submit yourself to Jesus, his power transforms your life. It makes you better. And if you're not getting better, you're doing something wrong. You need to talk. It transforms your life. When I was eight and accepted Christ, the first man I went out to share the gospel with on Tuesday night visitation. Any of you ever remember Tuesday night visitation, right? Every Tuesday night. First guy I went out with was an ex-con that had murdered two men in a drug deal. And he did 28 years. I said, dude, you know, I'm like eight. You're looking old, you know. You look, well, yeah, I'm 58. How long were you in prison? 28 years old. And I'd jump on the back of his motorcycle, and we'd go out and share the gospel. But you know what? No matter what we did, what, what transformed people's mindset about the gospel was not just the scriptures. It was the change in his life. He was a totally different guy. Loved his wife, loved his kids, worked two jobs to provide for him, was active in his church, active in his faith, loved the scriptures. He was a different guy. And when I talked to his wife about, man, has he always been like this? She's like, no. He used to knock me across the room. He put me in the yard ER five times. Golly bum. But the power of the gospel transformed his heart. From the old evil self that he was, it transformed him into a new creation. It made him fresh and new. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I know it sources from God, but I also know its nature is powerful. It transformed evil Saul of Tarsus who murdered people who were for the gospel into the guy who's the preacher for the gospel. I know the power of it, Paul says, because I experienced it firsthand in my own life and my own heart. The power of the gospel does this. It transforms our heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, For the heart is desperately wicked. The NIV says it's deceitful above all else. I don't know about you guys, but that sounds real bad. Okay? It's like spiritually getting the diagnosis of cancer. It's not good. It says the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all else. Who can understand it? But God does. The scripture says God searches our hearts and divides into our hearts with his word, and then he transforms us with the gospel. That's what the power of the gospel can do. It makes us into new creatures. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of that. Third, Paul would say what its purpose is, verse 16, right? It says the power of God for what? For the salvation of everyone. Its source is from God. Its nature is powerful like dynamite. But what does it do? What's its purpose? It saves people from their sins. It transforms our lives like we were just talking about. But what does it specifically do? Well, salvation means that you're saved from something. Okay, a buddy of mine was a firefighter for 16 years in Carl Springs. And I said, what was the hardest thing you ever did? What kind of fire? You know, I'm thinking backdraft the movie and some cool stories and all that. And he said, no, no, pff, that wasn't the hardest thing. I said, well, what was the hardest thing? He said, training. Every year I had to do this thing in the, in the firehouse. And I was like... What's the firehouse? He goes, oh, let's take a trip. So we went down to Bijou Academy, and they had a six-story concrete, solid concrete and steel structure that was to, like, mimic an apartment complex. And inside the floors, you had to run through these stairs, carrying the heavy equipment, all your gear and all that stuff. And inside the floors, they had these big nozzles that shot out natural gas, and they shot flames of death in on the firefighters. So he would run up through it, carrying a few hundred pounds of gear, get in there, and the room would be black as coal with smoke. And he'd have to get down below and try to walk his way and try to use his comms to talk to guys and use his flashlights and all that. And in the middle of that, his training instructor would press a button, and that room would be transformed into a fiery hell on earth. And if he wasn't low enough, he didn't survive the exercise. If he didn't wear his gear right, he didn't survive the exercise. And I'd say, what was the difference? What was the point of that exercise other than unimaginable fear? You know, what was the point of that? And he said, the point is, the guy that's your wingman, you're always going in pairs, you can do nothing to save yourself. 
His job is to find you in the midst of that and to pull you out. Boy, you better really like your buddy. You better take care of your buddy, buy him cake for Christmas. You know, and so the idea was your buddy had to save you, and you had to learn the feeling of powerlessness, and your buddy had to save you. That is exactly what it's like for us with our sin. The Bible says that all of us have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us have actively rebelled against God in our own ways. And so we need salvation. The gospel does what? It saves us. It's a salvation for everyone. From what? From sin. From when we fell short of God's mark. From not doing it right. It saves us from the penalty of sin. Jesus on the cross pays the penalty for our sin. It should be you and I that pay the penalty for our own sin and are lost forever from God. But instead, Jesus takes our place. He steps in our place on the cross, takes the wrath of God the Father, and pays the penalty for our sins, and legally makes us just before God the Father so that we can have a right relationship with him, Romans says. So it saves us from the penalty of sin. It saves us from the power of sin. I just told you about our friend who was a longtime inmate and how God changed his life. The power of sin was broken in his life and the power of righteousness, a righteousness from God, was activated and came full bloom. And it saves us from a future presence of sin. When we talked about heaven last week, when we get there, is there going to be any sin, crying, death, anything bad? No. Because there's no devil, there's no sin, there's no evil there. So everything's perfect. So in the future, he saves us from the presence of sin. So he saves us from the penalty, the power, and the presence of sin. He saves us from Satan. He saves us from ourself. He saves us from the second death, and he saves us from a horrible place called hell. That's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty good deal. All these things are bound up in the gospel. Now, I'll tell you a story about the African cheesecake virus, okay? The African cheesecake virus, you never want to get this. The African cheesecake virus happens to people that eat bad cheesecake. It's a rare disease. Now just work with me here, okay? <laughs> just work with me here. I know you're thinking, he's lost his mind. We need to get on to the Bronco game. The preacher's flipped out. But if you eat bad cheesecake, supposedly in this mythical world, you can get the African cheesecake virus. And if you get it, you don't know that you have it. It does no symptoms in your body. You feel just fine. But it's slowly wrecking havoc and going to kill you. So you go in for your annual exam, and you see your doc, and he says, hey, you know, you're this, that, and the other, and let's do your annual workup. Let's do a little blood work. I'll listen to your heart. I'll do your blood pressure, check you out. You do the duck walk, whatever it is. You know? Do they still do the duck walk? Maybe. But uh, he checks you out, and he comes back, and, and he says, you know what? We've sent your blood off, and I'll give you a call in a week. And he calls you in a week, and he says, guess what? You've got to see me today. You must get in here today. You have the rare African cheesecake virus. What? So you bust hump over to his place, and you get in the doctor's office, and he says, look, this is rare. There's only one cure in the whole world, and if you don't take it in the next couple days, you're going to croak. You're going to give it up. Wow, I went from being perfect to, wow, I'm real desperate to survive, you know, kind of thing. And the doc says, it's extremely expensive. I don't think you could afford it. It's millions of dollars for the antidote. And you're like, oh, man, bad, worse, bad, worse, bad. Is just get, what else you got for me, doc? This is horrible. And then he says, but I got good news for you. I have a box of it in the back room. And because I love you and you're my buddy, I'm going to give you a vial. One dose, one solution. You take it, you're cured, you're good to go. He gives you the dose. You take it home. You open your medicine cabinet. You put it on the shelf. You close the medicine cabinet, and you go make dinner. How many of you would do that? Nobody. Come on, dude. I got the African Cheesecake Factory in my body killing me the virus. It's worse than AIDS or, or Ebola or whatever else. I'm going to take that stuff, right? But people do that with the gospel all the time. They said, you have the deadly virus of sin. And 100% of you are going to die physically and spiritually, and you'll be lost apart from God in a place called hell. And people do this all the time in conversations that I have with them. Pastor, I'll do that later when I have a little bit more time. 
when I'm a little older and I've experienced more of the world, I've done some of the things I want to do, then I will give my life to Jesus. Have you lost your mind? Have you lost your mind? People die every single day of the most ridiculous and crazy things. Young, healthy people, old people, everything in between. You're rolling the dice. And the African cheesecake virus is going to get you. It's called sin. When you have the power of the gospel, it is the salvation for everyone who chooses it. We have to choose the solution and not put it on the shelf. We have to do it. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of its scope. Verse 16. It is for who? It's the salvation for who? It's for everyone. The beauty of the gospel is it's open for every single person that has ever lived of all time. It doesn't matter how bad your moral degradation is in your background. If it depended on how moral I was, I got no chance. It doesn't matter your skin color or your race or your creed or what you profess religiously or politically or socially. It doesn't matter where you're from or your family background. It doesn't even matter what you're doing today. The gospel is for everyone. It is the salvation that is for everyone, Paul says. And he even defines it earlier. Greeks and non-Greeks, that's everybody, right? That's everybody. Those who are Greek and those who are not Greek. And if you've ever had the pleasure of being in a worship service, one time we were in Ecuador in uh, Puerto Viejo, which is just up the mountain coast from Manta, which is on the, on the, well, basically the Ecuador on the coast, before you go out to the Galapagos Islands. And, and it's a, it was a, a prison colony. So Ecuador basically took all its bad people and dumped them in this floodplain up against the mountains where they thought they'd all drown. They lived on these stilted houses. And basically the criminal element took over and ran the mob in Ecuador from Puerto Viejo. It was nasty. So they said, hey, we're going out, we're going to do missions in Puerto Viejo. Well, great. Do I get body armor and a machine gun with that? I mean, how does this work? This is going to this bad place. Well, you go into this place, and we, we went to their hospital, we went to their schools, we went to some of their homes. My biggest job was being a big guy to step on the right parts of the planks and not fall through their floor a bamboo floor that wasn't exactly designed to support big guys like me. And then we went into their church and we worshipped with a female pastor in a healing service and speaking in tongues and all kinds of stuff that are unusual for Southern Baptists. But you felt the Holy Spirit there. And you felt God's Spirit move among the people. And you felt like you were one with them. And you had people from all over the world that were actually in that that place, that formal penal call, you had people from Germany, <clears throat> from Japan, and they came up from Brazil and, and from Russia, and, and it was like this weird amalgam of people. And I kept thinking as we were sitting there worshiping that this is kind of what heaven's going to be like. All the tongues, tribes, and nations and people groups gathered around the throne of God, Revelation 4 and 5, worshiping him in the fullness of the Spirit with Jesus Christ right there. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the scope of the gospel is for everybody. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been or who you are or who your background is. It doesn't matter. Last week when we went to the funeral of John Robinson, there was a video testimony that Mindy graciously loaded up on Facebook where he's speaking about simply the gospel. He's talking about, you know, this, that, and the other, my diagnosis, lung cancer, bone cancer, blah, 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 all stuff, but, but we simply just trust God. That's the gospel. You simply trust Jesus Christ to take care of your sins, to take care of your past, to take care of your present, and to take care of your future. And in that video, John spoke so eloquently with his wife, Renee, about we just simply trust it's not always easy. It's not always perfect. We don't know where we're going, but we trust God that he's got it. It's a very powerful testimony. If you haven't seen it, you've got to watch it. He simply gave the heart of a believer like Paul. The gospel is simply about trust. And the scope of it is for everybody, even a simple guy out in Delta, Colorado. It's for everybody, without exception. 
ultimately the gospel is about these things. The nature of God in his goodness and his love and in his justice to punish sin. Both sides of his personality. You cannot divorce one from the other. And then our relationship as his creation with him, that he designed us to be in perfect fellowship and relationship with him, and he wanted to hang out with us. Not because he needed us, but because he just wanted a creation to love and to extend his goodness and his grace and his wonderfulness onto. And we mess that up. In the process of messing that up, we can't fix ourselves broken. You ever see a dye in a metal shop where you inject mold stuff into it? And if that dye is perfect, whatever comes out of it is perfect. But if that dye gets dropped or broken or dinged or cut or something, then everything that's injected into that mold has that same ding or cut or break. Every single one. And that's how it was for us. Adam and Eve were perfect, but then they messed up in the garden. They rebelled against God. And after them, every human has that same brokenness and flaw. The same way. There's nothing you can do. You're born with it. It's how it is. And then once we're alive, we do actively rebel against God. If you're honest with yourself and you think about your life, we do actively rebel against God. God's been talking to me about something, and I've been arguing with him. So all the way to rifle, yesterday, I argued with God. Now that's moronic. On the way back from rifle, I said, okay, Lord, maybe I'm wrong, and I apologize about that, and you're right. I mean, even today as a believer, we rebel against God. Thank God for his salvation and his strength and his power in my life that he changes things. And Paul says about its reception, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of its reception. It is the power of salvation for everyone who does what? Who believes. Who chooses. You've got to accept the free gift of eternal life. It is by grace that you've been saved through your faith. It is a gift of God, not by our works, so that we may not boast, right? It's about believing, not behaving. It's not about anything you do. It's about what you choose, Jesus Christ or yourself. It's really that simple. Do you choose Jesus to be in charge of your life or do you choose yourself to be in charge of your life? It really comes down to those two things. Who's going to be on the throne of your heart? And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I've chosen Jesus to be in charge after I was in charge and I've seen the, ex the extreme power in my life and in other people's life and so I'm obligated and it is my pleasure to preach the gospel. And I cannot wait to get to Rome to share with you the transforming power of the gospel. But you have to do something with it. Faith is not about the head that you mentally assent. I believe that Jesus was God and he died and all that. I agree with that. That's not enough. The book of James chapter 2 says demons in hell believe that and still rebel against God. It's not about just your heart. Even though it's part of it, you have to choose to believe those facts. You have to choose in your heart to choose Jesus to give your life to him. But it's also about what you do. You have to take an action, just like you take the antidote for the African cheesecake virus out of the cabinet and you drink it. You have to choose to take Jesus Christ into your life to forgive you of your sins and to be in charge. And you have to drink from the living water that we talked about last week. And those who don't, unfortunately, never see God in the afterlife. Those who do are with him forever. It is the power of salvation for everyone. And it's God's righteousness, verse 17 says. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness to us that's by our faith. And it goes on to discuss those things. I want to close with a true story. Up in Boston, Massachusetts, there's a Park Street Church, a famous old church. And if you visit it, a friend of mine told me they have a plaque, a bronze plaque. And he was telling me about the plaque, and I thought, okay, it'll say it was dedicated in 1836 or 1771, you know, whatever, whatever. And he said, no, the plaque is made out to a service person. And I thought, okay, how does this work? How, why would you put a big plaque in your church made out to a service person. So he said, let me tell you the story. The plaque reads this, Joseph C. Oswicki, U.S. Coast Guard, second class, lost February 3rd, 1943, 
in the North Atlantic. I said, okay. He said, find a book called A Turtle on a Fence Post by Alan Emery and just read it. And I said, okay. I'm always interested in new stories and stuff. That's what pastors do. So I found an old copy of this. He Actually, he loaned me it. And I looked at it, and inside it, he was talking about the story. So, so Emery, the writer of the story, was the bunkmate of Joseph C. Oswicki. And they were in the Coast Guard pulling ship duty in Boston, Massachusetts during World War II. Like most guys after World War II began with Pearl Harbor, everybody enlisted, and they enlisted too, and they chose the Coast Guard. So their job was to pull ship duty for the Navy for ships in port. His buddy, Joel, Mr. Allen's buddy, Joel, finally out of his little farmhouse, you know, in South Dakota and out on his own, he went into town to a dance. He met a young lady. He comes back from the dance, the story is recounted, and he says, man, it's been the best night of my life. Food, drink, women, it's been great. We were dancing all night, and this young lady has invited me to stay with her for the whole weekend at her apartment. And since I have a week of leave coming up, I'm going to begin it this weekend with her. Well, Alan says to his buddy, then I'll be praying for you. I'll be really lifting you up in prayer. While you're with her, I'm going to be spending my spare moments when I'm not on guard duty on my knees praying for you. His buddy, Joel, says, what? You know, Joseph says, what? what's that all about? Come on, man, what's that all about? And he says, look, because when you go away for the weekend, when you come back, you'll be a different man than you are now. And Joseph says, why? And he says, because sin leaves a mark in all of our lives, and you can't get away from it. You'll be different. Come on, man, you're kind of ruining my weekend, blah, blah, blah. Joseph takes off. He shows up about an hour later and says, you hung this, I'll be praying for you all weekend around my neck. So I canceled by standing up this girl. I've ruined a great weekend that was going to be blissful. And you, you jerk, you know, now, what, what, so it, bottom line is this. What's this whole God thing about? Now that I'm here, let's do guard duty together. Tell me about this whole God thing. Emery shares the gospel in its fullness over the next three or four hours of guard duty with Joseph. Joseph understands for the very first time, and he's born again. He gives his life to Christ, and he's transformed over the next few days. He's studying his Bible. He's found in his quarters on the ship praying. He's talking to God as he's doing guard duty. He visits the church every single day. His life is different. He's not cussing. He's not, you know, he's not doing all the stuff. And the guy said, what happened to him? A minesweeper takes off for Iceland, and they need a guard to help up on deck. He volunteers. Two days into the journey to Iceland, a German U-boat torpedoes their ship, killing 100% of the men on board. For Joseph, the loss of a weekend of fun was an eternity of perfection and bliss. That's what the gospel does in our lives. The reason I love that story is because it's motivating to me. The people that I come in contact with, am I willing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? I don't mean being weird. I don't mean some plan of salvation. I just mean naturally. Telling them why Jesus is important to me and what he can do in their lives. It's up to them whether they accept it or not. But if I don't take the opportunity, there's a boatload of Joseph's they go out to sea, so to speak, in this world and never come home. And they die without Jesus Christ. Maybe if I share with some of them, they go out to sea in this world with Jesus and meet whatever's out there. The difference for you and I is whether or not we're willing to be one of the 20% or the 80%, whether we're willing to stand with Paul and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God to transform people's lives. And I boldly am willing to ch just challenge people with that, share that with people. Or whether we're going to be part of the 80% of Christianity that sits and says, 
I got my fire insurance and I'm not worried about everybody else. I don't think anybody actually sits and says, I don't want anybody else to go to heaven with me. I just think we get caught up in this world and we get busy and all of us do it. So there's no judgment here, but we can make an active choice this week. We've talked about heaven. We've talked about the gospel. What I want you to leave this place doing, other than going and watching the Bronco game, is I want you to take the opportunity somewhere this week, please, to share with somebody in your sphere of influence in whatever natural way is comfortable with you the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have the African cheesecake virus just like you had. You've been cured. Are you going to extend the same antidote to them? Let's pray.